we're just brainstorming about little things that we can do to support each other and support our clients uh, during this time. And I'm, I guess what I'm asking is for, as people think about their better angels, like what are the small things that we can do that maybe seem like they don't matter in the face of such a giant challenge, but actually do matter and are very important in how we face what's happening. That was Dr. Robin Walzer on Psychologists Off the Clock. We are four clinical psychologists here to bring you cutting edge and science-based ideas from psychology to help you flourish in your relationships, work, and health. I'm Dr. Debbie Sorensen, practicing in Mile High, Denver, Colorado. I'm Dr. Diana Hill, practicing in Seaside, Santa Barbara, California. From coast to coast, I'm Dr. Yael Schoenbrunn, a Boston-based clinical psychologist and assistant professor at Brown University. And from sunny San Diego, I'm Dr. Jill Stoddard, director of the Center for Stress and Anxiety Management. We hope you take what you learn here to build a rich and meaningful life. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. If you are a psychologist, social worker, marriage and family therapist, substance abuse counselor, nurse, or other mental health professional or student that's interested in developing your skills and act, which could be particularly helpful right now for your communities and clients, we highly recommend you check out some of the online programming at Praxis. You can find them at praxiscet.com. They have uh, trainings in ACT-1, sort of foundational training in ACT, as well as applying ACT with specific populations. They have training in using ACT for trauma, as well as ACT with teens in the DNA V model, ACT for OCD, ACT with parents. It's a great resource, and we hope that you can check them out at praxiscet.com. You can also find them on our website. Take care. This week's episode is a little bit different. We're pausing some of the episodes that we had scheduled to talk about the current events. There's so much going on with the coronavirus, COVID-19. We know everyone's really finding this period to be stressful, and we think it's really important to offer our listeners some strategies for coping with the emotional aspects of this. And we've invited back on the podcast, Dr. Robin Walzer, who's a frequent guest. I think this is her fourth appearance, if I'm counting right. She's the author of several books. Her most recent is called The Heart of Act, Developing a Flexible, Process-Based, and Client-Centered Practice Using Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. Robin is a true master of acceptance and commitment therapy. She's also an expert on trauma and PTSD. And we just love her thoughtful and compassionate voice. We thought she'd be a real comfort for us to talk to right at this current moment, as we hope you feel that way about listening to the podcast. Absolutely. And I know originally, Debbie, you and Robin were going to talk about a big picture uh, concept of existentialism and her writings on that. And you shift gears a little bit because it felt important right now to talk about the reality of the trauma that we're in right now, the here and now. I'm curious, Debbie, how are you taking refuge during during this time? How are you holding up? Well, I think as we talk about in the episode, I think my focus is just on the immediate what's right in front of me. You know, I've definitely, like most people, been on an emotional roller coaster ride and just feeling so much sadness and fear. And then I think most of the time I'm just figuring out, okay, what do I need to do today? You know, do we have, what do we have to eat? How are we going to stay safe? And I think that's where a lot of people are right now. It's just about getting through this period. How about you, Mm -hmm. Diana? Yeah, it, it's been interesting because I've, I've noticed sort of this, this shift of, of emotions early on, I would say maybe two weeks ago or a week and a half, half ago, I was in complete stress response. I, my physiology was through the roof. I could not sleep. I was so revved. I was going about trying to like purchase things and <laughs> make sure that we had, for me, my threat system went to, I need to make sure that we have enough food. And, and then it sort of shifted into actually appreciation of my family and the slowness and seeing the beauty in things and feeling connected and then shifted into despair. And what what I'm figuring out about all of this is that we're kind of complex and there's a lot of different emotions that can, can happen, even can coexist within us at a time. And that it's okay for all of those, all emotions are welcome. One of the the resources that I've been turning a lot to is Pema Chodron. And if you just look at the title of her books, there's a reason why we turned. So she has 
the book, Comfortable with Uncertainty, another book, Welcoming the Unwelcome, another book, When Things Fall Apart, (laughs) and then The Wisdom of No Escape, which I think is particularly appropriate right now where we're all kind of holed up in our homes. And what she really offers us is these ideas around what do we do when things fall, feel like they're falling apart? Where, Where do we turn to? And some of it is some of the, is the basics of getting food, having routine, making sure that you're going about the basics of getting through the day. Right. I think there's some interesting research about trauma in the immediate aftermath or right during traumatic events. And therapists used to try to swoop in to a big disaster or crisis and help people process things on an emotional level and, you know, replay trauma and that kind of thing. And what they've learned through the research is that actually in those moments, people just need comfort, safety. They need you to just sit there with them, get them a blanket, you know, a hot beverage, something like that. And I think Mm -hmm. that's kind of how it's feeling to me right now is that we're right in this, we're right in it right now. And I think mm-hmm. it's right at this moment, what we need are these things that are going to give us refuge, that are going to give us a feeling of safety and just make it through the period. Mm-hmm. So thinking about that for yourself, what brings you refuge? And maybe it's um, even if like a favorite TV show just to distract with. We've been watching some fun like cooking shows just to get our mind off of things for a bit um, or a favorite yoga class that you can attend or even just... Um, getting outside and having a moment of of seeing a little bit of spring peeking up. You know, I say in the episode, and I just want to repeat that, go easy on yourself. (laughs) You know, find things that don't feel like another thing you're trying to, you know, put, put more pressure on yourself right now. It should really be something that you enjoy because I think sometimes you think, oh, I have to have structure. I have to do this. I have to do that. And it's like, just make it through, you know? Well, it's been interesting because Yael and I are going to do an episode next week about parenting during this time. And initially, again, there was this big response and this big push of homeschooling and that we all need to get like our curriculum on board and making art projects. And, you know, and Debbie, you and I, sort of our group, were texting each other and we're like, my homeschool can uh, watch a show, fight with your brother and (laughs) crawl back into bed because you are so bored. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I think ACT is uh, just to tap into some of the processes of ACT that you may find particularly helpful right now. uh, This is a great time to think about more of the extended space strategies that ACT offers us. And the uh, the three that really come to mind are uh, looking at sort of ourself in in context, ourself in relationship to a bigger whole, and looking at mindfulness and how to get present in, in the present moment and just tending to the here and now. And then finally, this practice of acceptance, of acceptance with our body, acceptance with our mind, and really holding painful things maybe lightly for ourselves. That's but Debbie, I thought it'd be helpful for you to talk a little bit about self as context, because that's sort of the, the process that often gets left behind and not talked about what could be helpful right now. Well, one one of the things that we were talking about is this idea of kind of zooming out. I think for me and probably for a lot of people, this event has caused a massive perspective shift. I think I was so caught up in my day-to-day problems. I was really had a lot of stressful things going on in my own life the last couple months. And as soon as this happened, it just sort of reoriented me. And I think one thing that can be helpful is to zoom out and to look at your life sort of as a whole, that we have these ups and downs over the course of time. If you think about your entire lifespan and we're in a down right now. And I think that sometimes when we're in a period like that where we're suffering, we it almost feels like it's never going to end. This is how it's going to be forever. And I think there is something about shifting perspectives to recognize, okay, this is a tough period. I've had tough periods before. I'll have them again. It's not going to be like this forever. I think it does help just shift things. and Almost looking at your life as this big, long timeline. And here we are in this moment for now. Mm -hmm. but it's not going to be like this forever. Yeah. That zoom out to even thinking about times or situations that you have survived, that looking back at them, you like, wow, how did I do that? That didn't seem survivable. And that can strengthen us as well to, to see ourselves as moving through this flow of life that is, is really unpredictable. And there will be times in the future that are painful as well. 
And maybe we can appreciate for ourselves the the strengths that we have developed over the course of these these ups and downs. A lot of our growth happens in in this time during during these times when it's really painful and hard. And the acceptance piece, just as as kind of a reminder for folks, is really about accepting the full range of emotions that you're having right now. Like so many of us are feeling afraid, we're feeling sad, we're worried. We have major emotions happening and that that is that is okay to feel that it's it's human Mm -hmm. i think with acceptance as well that that taking a physical stance of acceptance with our bodies can be really helpful so i just been noticing my nervous system is on like brace mode where i'm like tensed up my jaw is tight my shoulders are tight my belly is tight like everything in my body and then i'm just like rushing around and Part of taking a bottom-up approach as opposed to a top-down approach with uh, acceptance. So rather than cognitively accepting, we can also accept with our bodies. We can slow our breath, slow our breath down, have a long exhale, release our shoulders, relax our face, and take an open accepting stance with our even just with our physical selves, which can be helpful in telling our um, you know that brain-body connection. Yeah. And Robin also talks in the episode about just that present moment focus. Again, just I'm okay now. I'm here now. Just sort of bringing it back to the moment during those times when you're just, the worry takes you down the road to the future and it's easy to get swept away by that. Just to go back to reorienting to this moment in time. And you might have to do that frequently. I think that people with substance use issues or people with eating disorders, it it can be really difficult right now because there can be a tendency to not have as much structure and have high levels of stress and also be really exposed to um, some of the triggers that can trigger your addiction or your struggle. And that's where self-care and you know, community connection, online connection, finding meetings, uh, and also setting up your environment in a way that to make it as healthy as possible for you is really important right now. I notice, you know, at least in our household, we're we're all struggling to we're losing our tempers with each other. Um, it's it's not the prettiest scene over here when we're all stressed out and cooped up. I know it's true. Every little thing starts to get magnified. And as a reminder, too, many therapists are offering video sessions right now. So if this is the case for you and you could use extra support, uh, go online and find a therapist who can do a video session for the time being because, you know, it is available. And AA meetings and NA meetings are online. There's a lot of eating disorder um, programming that is now online and virtual as well. So this is the time to, to turn to that. Please do take care of yourself. And we're going to post some resources on our website in the show notes for all of you to look into. Dr. Andrea Birnbaum at UCLA has developed a wonderful resource with lists of reading and um, information for all of you that we'll post. And then Debbie, I know you have some resources as well. We have a few resources. I actually found something really wonderful that Tara Moore, one of our guests, posted about handling tension and anger in the household, which I think is an issue that Robin talks about that's important. We have a few other helpful resources for you. So check out our webpage, offtheclockpsych.com. And we hope you enjoy this episode and the wisdom and compassion of Robin Walzer. I'm welcoming back on the podcast, Dr. Robin Walzer. Robin and I had been planning for the last couple of months to do an interview about existentialism, but we've decided to hold off on that. We're going to revisit that in a future episode together because instead it just felt really important for us to shift a little bit and talk about more specifically what it means to be alive right now during this really challenging time with the coronavirus. So on behalf of my co-host, Robin, I wanted to thank you for coming on and sharing your wisdom. I think we really need to hear from some compassionate and thoughtful voices right now. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's my pleasure, uh, Debbie. Thank you for inviting me back to Psychologist Off the Clock. Well, we were just sharing with each other that in some ways this feels like one small values-driven thing that we can both do right now. People right now are facing a lot of challenges and thinking about questions about what can I do? What's meaningful? How can I help? Yeah, no, I was thinking about our existential talk versus what we've shifted to. 
And, and so in thinking about that shift, I was reflecting back on something that um, uh, Barack Obama said. He called on our better angels to make uh, a better nation. And I think I'd like to invoke that same uh, uh, saying and call on our better angels to make a better world at this time and uh, uh, this very scary and uncertain time. Well, and we thought we might start on a hopeful note in this scary and un- un- and uncertain time because we are seeing a lot of humanity in all aspects, right? And I think one of the things that we're seeing is some pro-social things happening. We're seeing people who are thinking about the greater good. It's not all hope out there at the moment, obviously, but there, are, there, it is a mixed bag. Well, I'm so pleased to see people doing things that are uh, values-based and about pro-social and kind behavior. And so I find myself in this sort of strange balance or weird, surreal space of both seeing the good and also in recognizing and acknowledging the, the really awful uh, thing that's unfolding with the coronavirus. It's interesting because I think we're facing so many ethical decisions globally and also individually. And I think that one of the things that we're doing is trying to piece this together. How much are we willing to do to help save others? What are the small day-to-day behaviors that we can do? And your dear friend and colleague, Stephen Hayes, just came out with a blog post that I wanted to quote from because he, he goes on to talk about some small things we can do to help vulnerable people and to help the healthcare workers in the hospitals on the front lines. Things like just being more diligent about washing our hands and not touching our faces and some of the social distancing. And I just love this quote. Imagine that your life right now is a movie or novel. It's a story about an ordinary hero, you. Every action is being filmed or written down. In this story, the fate of this person's loved ones depends on the mundane choices he or she makes, moment by moment, day by day. In a sense, the hero is writing this story. I think it's uh, fantastic. And when I think about what he's saying, it is pointing to, you know, counting on our better angels and turning to our better angels. And you and I were talking about the different ways that we can do this in this moment of crisis and sort of the challenges of making certain kinds of decisions. Um, Like, do we pay the people who provide services for us? And, you know, do we continue to um, engage in things that are supportive of people that we know have less than ourselves? And uh, for instance, you brought up the idea of, paying your hairdresser and I'm going to follow suit because I have a hair appointment coming soon and I'm not going to keep the appointment, but I, I am in a position hopefully for a long period of time. We'll we'll see how things go, but currently I'm in the position to go ahead and pay her uh, for, because these folks are not going to be able to, you know, have any uh, work during this next period of time. That's right. How can can people come together to help support those whose whose livelihood is at stake as well? Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Although we were joking, both of us, and I thought this was pretty <laughs> funny about, uh, you know, who's going to, how old are we going to actually look once this <laughs> crisis is over, right? Is that not being able to dye our hair and that kind of thing. So. Right. We'll discover how much gray we really have <laughs> underneath all that hair dye. <laughs> <gasps> yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's such a, it's, we, you know, we take these things for granted and it just is a reminder of how quickly things can change and how important it is to uh, call on our better angels during these times. And, you know, even small things, I agree with you, like our, our um, clinic is closed to in-person services, our Bay Area Trauma Recovery Clinic, and we're holding services online now, as many um, psychotherapists are doing. And, um, but the community of that clinic of students is now saying, well, you know, we don't get to see each other. They they hang out uh, together in the clinic and get support from each other and talk to each other. And 
So in just a recent online meeting with them, we've decided to come together and have a little wine and arts and crafts party. And then we're going to create some mindfulness um, sessions and post them online for any of our clients to listen to. And we're just brainstorming about little things that we can do to support each other and support our clients uh, during this time. And I'm, I guess what I'm asking is for, as people think about their better angels, like what are the small things that we can do that maybe seem like they don't matter in the face of such a giant challenge, but actually do matter and are very important in how we face what's happening. And I love seeing all this flexible thinking and people being really creative about how we can come together, how we can support, you know, parents and grandparents, how we can help each other, help our children during this time. I think people are doing this in unique ways. No, agreed. I mean, you know, getting online and saying hello. uh, I mean, I even, I don't know how much we can do this because we're still a little bit unsure about how the virus is spread in all the ways that it's spread. But I would contemplating whether we're going to see um, regular mail pick back up again, right? Like people actually penning letters to each other. Um, I don't know if it's healthy. I'm not, check it out before you do something like that, but it is something that occurred to me. And there's, there's sort of a, I don't know, a little bit of a sweetness in it, or maybe um, what's the right word? sentimentality of, you know. My co-host Diana passed on the idea to me to enlist the grandparents in teaching something to the kids so they can prepare something and get online and do a little mini teaching or curriculum or something that it's a win-win-win, right? Because it gives the grandparents something fun and purposeful to do. The kids might learn something instead of just watching TV as my children are right at this very moment. (laughs) And it gives the parents a little breathing room to have a little bit of time. So it's, I think these kind of ideas are really um, just creative and and hopeful in themselves. Yeah, and I suppose um, when I think about our existence and where we were originally starting from is that you know, death is a um, a wake up call in many ways. You know, like you can see people reacting with a lot of fear and worry, and um, wondering about their family members and what's going to happen to them, to themselves and family members financially. And these, I think, are very valid in terms of um, the uncertainty and what's going to unfold in the future. But I don't think it has to take over. And I don't think it has, we have to be driven by it. We can acknowledge these fears and then make everyday choices that are about both practical things, like taking care of your family and making sure people are safe, but also very values-based things that are about um, giving in ways that are safe, loving in uh, ways that you can, and um, supporting, you know, humankind as we go through this crisis. Absolutely. One of the uh, things that I was thinking about in terms of better angels versus not is when we're in these kinds of scary times, people can be quite driven by fear. Uh, and we've got some examples of that where, you know, people are making runs on toilet paper. And my brother was telling me that he had driven by a garage with the door was open and someone was hauling goods in and out and their toilet paper was stacked from almost floor to ceiling. They had purchased so much. And, um, you know, people are afraid and like, why else would you be racing to the store to uh, buy toilet paper in the fashion that we've seen? I mean, it's understandable that people are doing that and stocking up on dry goods. I I don't want to put that down, but I also do wonder about the fights that have broken out over such things. And um, I know that guards have been placed in front of the toilet paper aisle and 
uh, you know, stores have had to put limitations on these kinds of things. This is just an example. I mean, there's plenty of other things, I think, that are uh, fear-driven as well. Um, and I'm hoping that we can, you know, think about some of the things that we do in acceptance and commitment therapy. And I know you and I are going to talk a little bit more about this in ways to sit with this fear and really open up to the anxiety and stress that's here in a way that we're not driven by it. And our behaviors um, become so selfish that we forget to, but we forget about humanity and we only think about the individual. I do think it's very good to have a little tiny bit of selfishness. We need to do those things like we want to live and, stay alive and we want to protect our families, but to have a whole lot of non-selfishness and, uh, you know, so that the, the balance is quite different between the two and um, kind of thinking that um, we can work, if we work on this together, that uh, we're probably going to be much more likely to do well than if we don't work on it together. Yeah. And I, so, think, I think sometimes we, we, focus on a behavior like that as a way of feeling better. It's a way to try to mitigate our own fear, right? Like, oh, well, if I have all the toilet paper that will fit in my garage, then maybe this won't affect me. And it's, it's not really going to do the trick. And there is a sense of, well, there's a cost to that for others. And maybe it's that balance between taking care of ourselves and also thinking about the greater good is really what we're trying to strike. I think that's exactly the point. And, um, yeah, no, I was talking with my brother about the, the toilet paper run. By the way, I mean, this is just an example of what people get free. You know, my, mo- my great-grandmother during the Great Depression saved the tinfoil tops off of TV dinners. There's probably some people in this audience who don't even know what a TV dinner is, right? Like, uh, remember those old tinfoil-wrapped... TV dinners that you poked oh, yeah. at and she saved every single one of those tinfoil wraps off the top during World War II because there was such a need to conserve and such a fear about not having it. I mean, even to the day she died, she had stacks and stacks of tinfoil uh, in her cupboards. And if you asked her if we could throw them away, she'd say no. And like it was a very fear-based behavior, like you know, I might need these someday and she died never using them. And um, so it's a, it's fascinating human behavior. And I, I can understand why we do these things, right? Like we're driven to, to live, we're driven to survive. It's very fundamental, primal kind of thing. And so our better angels need to like surface and help guide us a little bit more uh, in this time and to be really thoughtful of other people and do the things that include social distancing and um, washing your hands and all the things that Steve was talking about in his hero story. You know, there's lots of other flexibility is really important here. And this is psychological flexibility, right? Like there's lots of ways we can do this. And this is just a tiny example, but it was such a huge thing around, I mean, in many places in the world where people were um, hoarding toilet paper, that, uh, it, you know, being psychologically flexible around these kinds of things, I think can help, um, as you're saying, mitigate some of that drive to, to suppress the fear. That's right. That's right. Right. If you're looking for a great way to support us here at Psychologists Off the Clock and make your life easier and healthier, you should go to my new favorite online store, Thrive Market. Thrive Market carries all your grocery and household essentials with the convenience of getting everything online and then quickly shipped right to your door. And right now you can get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift if you go to thrivemarket.com slash POTC. I love that I can use specific filters to curate my shopping experience so I can find organic meats and low sugar snacks for my kids. Plus, when you join, they give to a family in need. How cool is that? So join in on the savings with Thrive Market today and get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. Go to thrivemarket.com POTC for 30% off plus a free $60 gift. 
That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash P-O-T-C, thrivemarket.com slash P-O-T-C. I know I talk about my kids a lot, but I also have two adorable dogs, Tilly and Hazel. We love to spoil them, which is why we love Whole Life Pet. Whole Life Pet makes single ingredient treats, meal mixers, supplements, and hydrating snacks for both dogs and cats. And if you try out Whole Life Pet, you're surprising your pets with fun new flavors while also supporting psychologists off the clock. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off your first order with free shipping over $50. When I open the Tuscan Blend Bistro Bowl meal mixer to add to Tilly and Hazel's food, they start wildly sniffing and can't wait to dig in. The best part is Whole Life Pet uses a freeze-dried process that locks in nutrients and freshness, and they never add chemicals, additives, preservatives, or anything artificial. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off your first order with free shipping over $50. If you're unsure about what to try, you can fill out their short questionnaire by clicking the red Start Today button on the home page. It will ask you a few questions and make custom product recommendations for your pets. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off today. So uh, many people, I think, are wanting to find ways to help, therapists included, not just with those sort of practical things like that we've been talking about so far, but also with the emotional part. You know, we're clearly in the midst of a lot of trauma and stress right now. I think we're just getting started with some of this. We're really acutely in it right now. You, Robin, are an expert on trauma. You've written books on trauma and worked in this field for a long time. Let's start with advice for what's most helpful right now in the immediate moment, just some practical tips that you have. Yeah, no, that's a really great idea. And I think that um, I do want to expand on like those very practical things all the way up to things that are more about just self-care and include things like mindfulness. But just practically, um, safety, right? Like doing things that feel safe to you um, and stability and you know, maybe thinking about what makes me feel safe. Uh, Whether it's, you know, sitting in a comfortable chair or talking to family members or talking to your psychologist, like what helps me have a sense of safety? And um, seeing if you can uh, pull uh, together between yourself and your family members ideas about just having a sense of safety, talking to your children in ways that, feel safe and offering them, um, you know, love and kindness and presence in these moments are the kinds of things that help establish that. Um, I think, too, uh, the other thing that's quite helpful for people is good information gathering. You know, if we, with the more information we have, the more we're able to feel safe. And so, you know, be careful about Facebook pages and, you know, social media that's generating myths and um, generating uh, uh, things that just aren't true about what's happening with the virus and, you know, what the what's actually going on in the world around this. I mean, um, I think contacting the CDC, you know, looking at their website listening to people like Dr. Fauci, like these folks really do know their information. And so, and thank God it's available to to everyone. And I think if you're in another country and listening to psychologists off the clock, you know, look for who your top leaders are uh, or uh, use the United States information if you so choose. I don't want to be ethnocentric about that, but Uh, want people to really be thoughtful about where they're getting their information and, you know, staying away from uh, information and news that isn't helpful. And so, you know, double check your facts and turn to, you know, the governmental agencies that um, actually are providing good facts. And Dr. Fauci is a good example. So, and get some information and read it and be thoughtful about it. And uh, rather than, panic about what you're hearing just take a little bit of time and think on it and and act on what they're asking you to do i think there's other things that you can do to increase these 
um, sense of safety, the things like um, not watching the news 24-7, you know, turning the TV off or, you know, turning the channel to other interesting movies and shows that you like. Um, I think not watching the news before you go to bed is a good idea. You and I were talking about sleep and how both of our sleep is kind of interestingly disrupted initially, but now we're getting a little bit, bit more sleep that we get to stay home. Good sleep hygiene, you know, creating a routine is very important. Like keep your family as structured as possible. Get up at the regular time and eat breakfast, go to bed at a regular time, eat dinner together, like all of those kinds of very practical things. And hopefully it doesn't sound too um, simple to people, but this is exactly the kinds of things that help create safety is routine, not getting too far into the news, you know, um, uh, slowing down a little bit more and taking your time. I think those are very important things that you can do. And then just giving ourselves a break, right? Like that some of those things that we normally might expectations put on ourselves. It's like, just give yourself a little space right now because it is so hard. And that's part of creating that feeling of safety is like letting go of the unimportant things. Oh yeah. Go easy on yourself. Right. Yeah. No, you were saying earlier in a conversation that we were having earlier that, you know, one of the things that these kinds of crises do is like get your attention to tune into what's really important, you know, and sort of the daily things that we're, you know, hassling about drop down in terms of order of priority and safety becomes the top priority. And, um, you know, so thinking about ways to create that I think can be very useful for people right now. Yeah. One of the things that can happen when people are asked to shelter in place or if they're in lockdown and they're not um, able uh, to get out and, be away from each other for a while is that, you know, if you're cooped up together, tempers can flare and people can be agitated or they don't get the break from their children that they usually get, whatever the circumstance might be. And so um, it's unfortunate, but when there are these kinds of, um, you know, stay in close quarters that uh, 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 people can be more abusive, like in, uh, violence, domestic violence rates can go up and abusive children can go up and I really just invite anybody struggling with agitation or anger, frustration, uh, any of those things that might, and you're, and you're temperamentally one of those people who has a hard time dealing with these things is to, you know, do things to help yourself and to keep everyone protected. That might be as simple as, you know, going out in the backyard and pacing, walking it off. Uh, It might be as simple as putting yourself in a different room, taking some time. It might be saying something to yourself like, "Uh, this will pass. I'm going to manage this in a way that's, values based instead of in a way that's control based uh so practicing patience kindness uh are going to be i think very important in this time for folks who feel temperamentally um challenged by uh being put in spaces with people where you're not able to move around as much as you might move around we earlier were talking about alcohol as well in terms of sleep habits. For one thing, alcohol impacts sleep. But I'm also thinking in terms of just maintaining peace in the household. I think that just kind of watching your alcohol yes. is important I, right now because it's. I think there's that temptation of like, oh, we're all bored at home. Let's just <laughs> start great. drinking all day. <laughs> well, and interestingly enough, Toilet paper sales have gone up and alcohol sales have gone way up. Yeah. So people are making a run on alcohol too because they are going to, they know they're going to be at home and maybe dealing with boredom. And, and this is where we can talk about some of the acts, things that people can do, acceptance and commitment therapy, things that people can do here too. But that's right. Like really watch how much you're drinking. 
this isn't a time to consume more, it's a time to consume less, both because you'll be more in control of your behavior and less likely to harm others, and also because it'll help you sleep better. And um, it makes me think of caffeine as well, like watch your caffeine intake. Uh, sometimes when people are nervous, interestingly enough, they drink more caffeine or um, when they're in um, a home, they just drink pot after pot after pot or, you know, I think it's, you know, be thoughtful about how much you're, how much caffeine you're putting in your body. Mm-hmm. Exercise, right? Like keep exercising. And one of the things that if you read our, the California's um, shelter in place, like it's right in their uh, mandate, like, you know, stay home you can go outside to exercise and I think that's very important and I'm so happy to see that they put that in there is like keep your body moving and don't let yourself get sedentary during this time even though you're closed in if you need inspiration you can check out our last episode which was with Kelly McGonigal on the joy of movement and she has some creative ideas for just moving more because it is it's really tempting to just sit around and watch tv right now and it's Okay, fine, but you also it would be really good for you to to move a little bit and get out and walk your dog, that kind of thing. So nice. these these are really helpful practical tips for here and now, just everybody making it through this safely. I also think about our ongoing coping as this continues in the months of head ahead and and it does come to mind to think that psychological flexibility, acceptance and commitment therapy has a lot to offer. I know people are just really facing a lot of emotions all over the place, you know, just extreme fear, panic, loss. I'm really personally, I'm sitting a lot with the sadness right now of what's, what's, what we're facing in terms of losing people potentially, and also just other aspects of our lives that we're kind of missing out on right now. Um, Do you have any thoughts, Robin, about how that model can be helpful to people in, in the longer term emotional coping? Absolutely. Well, so, you know, we've got um, present moment processes that I think can be so helpful because in this time of crisis, people are, you know, worrying about what's going to happen next and really spending a lot of time in what's going to happen to me, what's going to happen to my family, what's going to happen to my finances, right? So there's a lot of worry that's very oriented towards the future. And so, Part of what that does, though, is, of course, it takes us out of what's happening right here and now. And even in a time of crisis, I think being present to your coming back to yourself can be very helpful. Uh, I'll give a quick example. I was working with a client who was really experiencing um, a lot of almost terror about what was what's unfolding and they're in a hot spot. They're, you know, in one of the places where the coronavirus is just taking off and their family may have been exposed. And so the person is just like really feeling very scared about what could potentially unfold for themselves and their, and their family. And uh, we did a, just this really, um, present moment, grounding, getting in touch with openness to um, where she was feeling the fear, which was largely in her chest, where she was, what she was noticing in terms of the tension in her body. Um, she's a spiritual person, so we focused a little bit on spirituality and, you know, feeling a sense of um, her soul or spirit and just resting into a place that's open to the moment was very helpful for her Uh, she was able to sort of drop from her mind which was just buzzing with fear and worried thoughts about um, what's going to happen and are they going to live and be okay into I'm alive now my heart is beating now I'm breathing now I'm not dying in this moment and um the world isn't in this moment harming me. I'm alive and my family's alive. And that sort of presence was very helpful. And I think that we can all uh, work on practicing those things if we get caught up in fear. 
is dropping into the present moment and noticing that we're alive now. And it's not a panacea. I'm not saying that this is going to be the answer to all of the problems that people are encountering right now. Clearly, that's not the case. But if you're really finding yourself struggling with worry and fear, like coming into a centered and present sense of self can be a very useful um, experience to connect to. Uh, and then I think um, connecting to your values is going to be really important too, reminding yourself of what you care about. And indeed, that kind of intense fear points to what's important to us. When we're worrying and fearful, like, it's telling us that we care about our families and our friends and ourselves and we want to be okay and to sort of see if we can let ourselves orient to the value and not be driven by the fear, I think can be quite useful for people as long-term coping strategy. And so practicing every day, even for a few moments, and your mind is going to say, I don't have time, I'm worrying about this, I don't want to do this. And really taking the time to do it anyway and uh, reconnecting to what you matter most about, I think is important. Calling, I mean, be interesting if each day we could like, what, what would my better angels want me to do today? I love that. Just remember your better angels when times get tough. I think that's helpful. And, and just having that sense of mindful awareness and openness to all of this. To me, those moments when I feel that sadness around it, I think all I can do is just let myself feel that for a while. And then, you know, and then I go on about my day, but it's like, this is just a hard thing and there's no way around it. And I think it's, there is that room to just have awareness and, and acceptance of it and just keep doing, putting one foot in front of the next to, to okay. do those things that feel like our better angel selves would want us to do. Yeah. No, and I was thinking about, you know, like, how do you bring compassion into these places when we're so fearful and you know, in some of the existential work that um, I wrote about in the Heart of Act and that you and I were gonna, going to talk about today, and we will, I'm looking forward to that conversation, um, is this idea of compassionate immediacy. And I think it's relevant here and also has to do about, it has to do with acceptance and commitment therapy, is this idea that life really is precious. And we don't know when um, our time will come or uh, when the people that we care about, their time will come. And, and so engaging in our values now just feels more important than ever. Because you can sort of imagine, like, you know, if this thing lasts for several months, which they're predicting it is going to be that way, and the impact of it is going to last for maybe a year, a year and a half, you know, maybe longer, is that... Um, you could spend that whole time in deep fear and and worry and struggle and you know really finding yourself in a place where um, like the whole experience becomes about anxiety and I guess my hope for the people who are listening and for the people who they serve that we could find places where we could bring hope and a sense of connection to values and a, and an openness to our anxieties, but not be driven by them as we serve ourselves and others in this process. That's beautiful. I love that. I, I think that maybe we can kind of wrap up by talking about this a little bit more that just this idea that we, this is really a shared human experience. I think it's related to what you were saying about compassionate immediacy. There's this sense of this broader perspective taking. It just really feels to me like we're all in this together. We have this sense of life is precious and we, we want to all do what we can. And for me, this might sound a little bit strange or morbid or counterintuitive, but I find sometimes when I'm feeling just upset by something that's that's causing me suffering, it helps to remind myself that that in that I'm not unique, that human suffering is something that we all experience and that I'm not immune from that. And so often when we suffer, we're suffering, it feels like we're alone with it. But right now I just feel like we, we're all sort of coming together with this. And it does create this massive perspective shift around 
um, what's really important. No, I agree. And um, the idea of a common humanity is something that I hope um, we can turn to. Um, the, uh, you know, like imagine a common humanity bringing their better angels forward in this moment, like all of humanity. Like that would be pretty powerful if we, you know, all sort of stepped forward in that way and recognize the suffering and hold each other in the, in the loss and pain that is happening because it's happening. I mean, I, I was, maybe you saw this on the news. I was seeing that a family of seven was affected with, or, um, infected with the virus and four of them passed away. You know, like it's tremendous amount of loss and grief and uh, being able to um, recognize that uh, they, we want to offer compassion for them and uh, that we, you know, we can do the same for ourselves as as we're as we're doing it for them, and um, that clearly the last thing to do, it seems, and this is my personal opinion, is to hide, um, sequester, follow the shelter in place, don't hide with your values, and and you know let people know that you care about them, that you love them, and that um, what are the things that we can do given the limitations that we're under right now? And I think there's lots of things for us to think about. Paying our hairdresser, uh, paying the cleaning lady. Uh, if, you, if you have the capacity and the ability to do so, you know, if you have a garage full of toilet paper, I don't know. Maybe give some of it away, right? Mm -hmm. Or take it to somebody who you know needs it. Um, like those are the kinds of things that I'm thinking about. And, um, you know, uh, hopefully my better angel can be a part of this process. I have fear about it too. Like I find myself waking up in the morning, mm -hmm. thinking about it and being quite anxious. And do I have the virus? Am I going to get the virus? Probably at some point, based on what they're saying. Um, do I have to spend my day in a space of panic and crisis? No. Um, I've got little doggies that I want to be with, and I've got um, hummingbirds in my backyard that I want to check out. And, um, I've got a conversation with you that I want to have, right? Like the, so, those are those are the kinds of things that I'm I'm hoping that that people will turn to in this time. I hope so too, Robin. I appreciate that. I think that's it. It kind of goes back to where we started with just the sense of you know finding these small things we can each do to find meaning that brings out the better angel. Absolutely. And well, thank you so much for for sharing these thoughts. It's it, like I said, it's it's just helpful. I think sometimes in these moments to hear a a compassionate and wise voice, and I'm so appreciative. It really means a lot to me that you're here, and you're going to come back again soon for us to delve when the time feels right to delve a bit more into more general thoughts about existentialism. Yeah, existentialism and death. Um, I'm, it's really a, an interesting time in the world where that's going to be more in our awareness. And so uh, want to be thoughtful about how we approach those kinds of big issues that, um, are, that we're going to be facing right, and that right. we are facing. But I'm super appreciative of having me uh, uh, be on the um, psychologist off the clock. And I just want to send um, good wishes of health to, to everyone who listens and to all of their a clients and the work that they're doing and stay safe and healthy. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. You can find us on iTunes, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Please help us out by writing a review on iTunes. We'd like to thank our interns, Dr. Catherine foley Saldania and Dr. Katie Lear. This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only and is not meant to be a substitute for mental health treatment. If you're having a mental health emergency, dial 911. If you're looking for mental health treatment, please visit the resources on our webpage. We're at offtheclockpsych.com.